Let's do. Everybody praise the Lord. If you are awake at the Alpha location, I said praise the Lord. I welcome you to this special service today. And all of us all over the world connected with us at the Alpha location here. I pray the blessing of God of total supernatural freedom flow into every life in Jesus name. And as God is doing wonders here, he'll be doing wonders everywhere in every life in Jesus name. Father, we thank you today and bless your name. We thank you Lord because you called us to worship. And in worship there is blessing, there's freedom, there's deliverance and there is blessing overflowing from heaven. And we pray, Lord, everyone at the worship service today, everywhere, will experience a divine touch and supernatural freedom in Jesus' name. Confirm your blessing upon every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen before you sit down. God bless you. You can sit down. Today we're coming to Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 7. Exodus chapter 3. We're reading from verse 7. It says, And the Lord said, And the Lord said, And what the Lord said then, He's still saying today. Because He says, I am God, I change not. And the Lord said, and the Lord says, I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry. God has heard your cry. God has seen your tears, and your wife all the tears away in Jesus' name. They cry by the reason of their taskmasters. For I know, I know, I know their sorrows. Now he tells us in verse 8, in verse 8 he says, And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. You are going to a better place. I said we are going to a better place. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, Come now therefore and I will send thee unto Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt out of Egypt today you are out out of every dungeon out of every bondage out of every calamity that has followed you until this day by the time you enter the middle of this week a new month new life new joy new achievement because the Lord is bringing you out of and is going to bring you into the land flowing with milk and honey. I receive. Look at Exodus chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 13. Exodus chapter 6 verse 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron. He spake unto Moses. Now, he had spoken unto Moses before. Aaron now joined. And the message remains the same. Moses started. Aaron joined on to project, to proclaim, to declare, and to emphasize the same message that had been given to Moses we started and God gave us the message bring them out take them through bring them in and Aaron may join 
an overseer may join a national overseer region overseer state overseer may join a minister may join when you join as Aaron joined Moses the same declaration and the same word the Lord now said he gave them a charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh king of Egypt bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. There is uh, no alteration. There is no modification. And there is no change. The same message given originally out and then in. That same message the Lord is still giving today. And any preacher that follows after the foundation that we have laid must understand you come in to emphasize to preach to proclaim to declare that same message out of the world out of sin out of darkness into the glorious light of the gospel look at verse 26 in verse 26 these are that Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their armies we're here all through this time the crusade time the worship time the teaching time for supernatural freedom i am here for supernatural freedom how about you how about you declare that out aloud i am here for supernatural freedom if you have not got it you'll get it right now the topic today now is supernatural freedom through scriptural faith think about that supernatural freedom scriptural faith they go together and it is the foundation of that is the fountain of that is the fortress we have that with scriptural faith in the lord everyone will have supernatural freedom we're looking at this under three perspectives number one number one the foundation of supernatural freedom through faith everything through faith number two the fountain of sufficient fullness through faith and number three the fortress of steadfast fortitude steadfast fortitude by faith number one through faith number two through faith number three through faith we're coming to number one now number one the foundation what could you build without foundation? Where could you go without foundation? What could you have without foundation? We need the foundation. And from the very beginning, the Lord set the foundation. Even in creating the world, you have the foundations. And if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Number one, the foundation of supernatural freedom through faith. We're looking at Exodus chapter 12, reading from verse 12. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, all the idols, all the superstition of Egypt, will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And then he tells us in verse 13, in verse 13, 
and the blood shall be to you for a sign for a token upon the houses where ye dwell where ye are and when I see the blood I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt that's the foundation they have to go through the blood they have to be under the cover of the blood they have to be be under the covenant of the blood. They had to add the cleansing and the covering of the blood. And it is the foundation. Whatever we get later, the blood of the Lamb is the foundation. The sacrifice of Christ is the foundation. The sacrifice at Calvary. And what Jesus did at the final sacrifice as a substitute, as our salvation, our Savior, that is the foundation of everything we have the foundation of supernatural freedom through faith there are three things we're looking at here number one the peace and the pardon through saving faith saving faith the faith that saves the faith that gets us out of darkness into the light pardon and peace through saving faith number two purging and purity through sanctifying faith faith is many sided it's like the diamond you look at it this side you see the salvation and then you look at that that side you see the sanctification and then you look at it another direction and it's putting you into the strength in the power of the Holy Ghost number one is the pardon and the peace through saving faith number two purging and purity through sanctifying faith number three possession of power through strengthening faith let's look at number one Number one, we're talking about the pardon and the peace through saving faith. When you come to the Lord, turning away from your sin, and you remove yourself, you remove your hand, you remove your mouth, you remove your eyes, you remove your ears, you remove your feet, you remove your personality. You remove your totality out of sin and you turn your back against sin. That's when the pardon of God and the peace of God comes to you. Look at this, Luke chapter 7. We're looking at verse 47. It says, Wherefore I say unto thee, as sins which are many, are forgiven. There's the woman that came to Jesus Christ, the burden of her sin, the conviction of her sin, the heavy load and guilt of her sin broke her down. And she began to weep. And tears were coming out. And the Pharisee was saying, look at this. If Jesus had been a prophet, he would have known that this woman was a sinner. Yes, a sinner. That's why she was crying. A sinner. That's why she was weeping a sinner that's why the heart was broken a sinner that's why she was turning away and in her tears saying i made a mess of my life in the past and i want a turning around and she cried and jesus said her sins which are many are all forgiven look at verse 50 in verse 50 it tells us and he said unto the woman thy faith has saved thee, saving faith, saving faith, thy faith has saved thee, go, go in peace, forgiven, set free, her faith set her free, she had pardon and peace, pardon, and then the peace of God settled in her heart, when you come to the Lord like that, that's how you know you are saved, you are pardoned, and then the peace of God settles in your heart, we're looking at Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1, Romans chapter 5, and we're reading here from verse 1, therefore be justified by faith, 
our argument cannot justify us you go to the court of law and then you argue you argue i am free i'm free your argument cannot justify you your lawyer that says yes my client is free his argument cannot set you free it's when you come in repentance I bring no other plea. I have no argument. I look at the cross and I see Jesus Christ who died for me. I was the guilty one. I was the one that couldn't pay the price of my guilt and condemnation. But he on the cross died for me. No other plea but that Christ died for me. And then you are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2 there. In verse 2, by whom also we have access by faith. By faith. All by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now you are headed for glory. This grace is gone. Condemnation is gone. You are pardoned. You are set free. You are forgiven. And the peace of God coming from the throne of the Prince of Peace now comes in your heart. We have pardon and we have peace through saving faith. Look at number two here. Number two here, we're looking at purging and purity through sanctifying faith. Sanctifying faith. You know, some people do not understand. They think faith is only for healing, healing. Yes, of course. They think faith is only for deliverance, deliverance. Yes, of course. But faith is for sanctification. Faith is for the purging of the heart. Faith is for the purity of the heart. Look at Acts chapter 15 verse 9. Acts chapter 15 verse 9 and he put no difference between us and them between the Jews and the Gentiles, between the apostles and the disciples, he put no difference between us and them, between the minister and the member. You know, there are people that think that sanctification is only for ministers, only for the apostles. Well, water drinking is not only for the minister, for the minister and for the member. Water drinking, the water of life and the water that washes and cleanses us and purges the heart and purges the soul that brings holiness into the heart of man the water is not for only the ministers, it's for the members, not only for the apostles it's for disciples, not only for the men it's for the women, not only for the old, it's for the young and he put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith, purifying purifying their hearts by faith. Now, when it says purifying, there was a time Elisha was at Jericho. And, it, and the people of Jericho came to him and they said, the land appears good, beautiful. And, but they said, the water is not. Because there is poison in the water. And then he said, bring me a cruise of salt and threw to the very source and the water was healed. The water was purified. It's a picture of the man that he looks beautiful on the outside. I am saved. I have peace. I have pardon. And then when you look at the outward life, true, gentleness has come. Humbleness of mind has come. Everything on the outside looks beautiful very well but out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh you see something coming out you say the heart is not the heart is not pure and you see the actions that come out of the heart you see the, the man looks gentle and the woman looks gentle and looks humble but the thing coming out of the very source of his life is not and then Christ 
touches that heart, purges that heart, and purifies that heart as you come. And you come with this level of faith, saving faith, your arch at salvation, sanctifying faith, you now have at the point of sanctification. It purges you and it purifies you, purifying their hearts by faith. Look at um, Acts chapter 26, and I'm reading from verse 18. Acts chapter 26, verse 18, to open their eyes. Was he talking of physically blind people? No. He was talking of people that read Isaiah chapter 53 and they didn't see Jesus there. He was talking about people that read the Exodus chapter 12 and they didn't see Jesus, the Lamb of God, that they were blind. And they read Psalm 2 and they saw that the Father, the God of heaven, spoke to his Son. They didn't see Jesus in the scriptures. Now tell me, Philip, who is this scripture talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about another one? And Philip opened his mouth at that time, at that point, and from that scripture preached unto him, Jesus. There are people that read their Bible, they don't see Jesus, our sanctifier. There are people that read the Bible from cover to cover, they didn't see Jesus Christ as the purifier and the refiner of the soul, as the one that will transform us inside, out, outside, and inside. And so God said, Paul the apostle go and open their eyes and as you open their eyes turn them from darkness to light and from the power of satan unto god that they may receive look at this number one that they may receive forgiveness of sin and number two inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in Christ sanctified by faith the faith of the person talking to him Christ was talking to him faith that is in me he sanctifies us he purifies us as we come we're sanctifying faith the faith that saves number one the faith that sanctifies number two and then we're set free set free and number one we're set free from the external sin from the branches of the tree producing sin in our life number two we're set free from the inner sin in what sin depravity it sets us free supernaturally it tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 and I'm reading uh, uh, sorry 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 22 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 it says abstain from all appearance of evil you are pardoned you are peace with God Things are different now since I came to Christ. If any man be in Christ, born again, it says it's a new creature. Old things are passed away. You don't think about them anymore. You don't plan on them anymore. You don't go that direction anymore. Even the appearance of evil, abstain from all appearance of evil. And then in verse 23, in verse 23, it says, and the very God of peace sanctify. The very God of peace has given you peace at salvation. Pardon at salvation. And now that very God that gives you peace at the point of salvation sanctify you holy. And I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can he do it? I said, can he do it? My people have gone to sleep. I said, can he do it? Look at verse 24. It says in verse 24, faithful is seed that calleth you. He called us to salvation. He did that. He calls us now unto holiness. 
He calls us unto purity. He calls us unto sanctification. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He'll do it in every heart. Peace and pardon, he'll do that. Purging and purity, he'll do that. Number three now, in the possession of power through strengthening our faith. When faith comes, we're strengthened. There's something else. Fear weakens us. Fear blindfolds us. Fear takes away our mind. Fear makes us forget where we're coming from, where we are, and where we're going. Fear makes us to forget the purpose of our calling. Makes us to forget the provision of Christ from Calvary. But when fear gives way and faith comes in, darkness will vanish away in your life. Ignorance will vanish away in your life. And that heart palpitation, and you're so afraid, can I pray? Can I go on? Can I seek the promise of God? Can I possess the promise of God? When faith comes, then that courage and that conviction that this is what God has provided and I'm going to have, you will have. I will have. I said, I will have. There is the possession of power through the strengthening of faith. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 16. Ephesians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 16. It says that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man now weakness comes from the inner man the man looks large the man looks hefty the man looks great and is taller than the average person but the heart is weak and the heart is fearful and the heart is trembling the outer man looks terrific but the inner man is trembling that's the reason why we see people who are supposed to be strong they're supposed to be great they're supposed to confront anything that comes against them because you look at them and you think their stature their physique their figure will be able to endure anything but the inner man needs to be strengthened and when the holy ghost in power when it comes to you you are strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man look at verse 17 there verse 17 that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith the one that never lost any battle the one that overcame every temptation the one that overcame the devil and he said it is finished that he that conquering christ that mighty christ that christ that never lost any battle may dwell in your hearts by faith that she be rooted and grounded in love may may know all that god has provided acts chapter one we're looking at verse eight but he shall receive power after that the holy ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria unto the uttermost part of the earth unto the uttermost part of the earth and you see that there it started with in jerusalem in jerusalem that's where Christ was crucified. In Jerusalem, that's where the Pharisees upheld the tradition of the fathers against 
the gospel. And the disciples were so much afraid. They were saved. They were so much afraid. And they were behind closed doors. And then Christ came to them and said, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you into the world. But they didn't leave that room there. They were still in that inner chamber because they needed the power. You've got the pardon and the peace, good. You've got the purging and the purity, good. But if you're going to come, because unto the uttermost part of the earth, the uttermost part of the earth, the way the first century disciples were threatened and they were fearful, the same way the people in the uttermost part of the earth, the same way we're threatened, and they tell us, shut up. And they tell us, don't come here. And they tell us, don't talk about Christ and they uplift their tradition in the uttermost part of the world like those people uplifted their tradition and if they succeeded by the power of the Holy Ghost that is the only way we can succeed today and so it says you shall receive power I will receive power I said I will receive power you cannot even talk. Eh? When we're here, we're believers. No pursuit talk here. If you cannot say you'll get power while we're here and we're together in the fellowship, when you get to the territory of the enemy, how can you talk? We will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. The weakest saint of God, the weakest child of God, when the power of the Holy Ghost comes, it will be turned to another man. It will have supernatural power to go and search other people free. Look at chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 8. Acts chapter 8, we're reading from verse 8. Chapter 6, verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith. Faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Now, when it says, and Stephen, full of faith, what does that mean? When you fill a bucket to the brim, and there is no space for another drop of any other thing full of faith. So full of faith, no drop of fear, no drop of timidity, no drop of apprehension. When the Lord comes to you and he makes you full of faith, the saving faith, the sanctifying faith, and the strengthening faith, and he makes you mighty and powerful, and there's no drop of fear in your heart, and then you look straight, you know, that's where I'm going, and the power of the Holy Ghost will propel you. You will get there in Jesus name. Look at uh, Luke chapter 24. We're reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 24 verse 49. And behold I send uh, you. I send the promise of my father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power until ye be endued with power, until ye be overwhelmed, saturated with power from on high. But tarry, but tarry. The believers of nowadays, they no more tarry in the presence of the Lord. Once they hear the preaching, and then after the preaching, there's a little prayer. Immediately, they are running for the bus. They are running to their home. They are running on the road. They, are, they might even be running to, you know, just talk, talk, talk among our people and tarrying in the presence of God. God that we will know it's only for the tarrying people it's only for the faithful people it's only for the people that understand uh, I've got peace I've got pardon I need more I've got purging I've got purity I need more I now need the possession of the power of God that will carry me through all the things I need to do in the service of soul winning and bringing people uh, onto
unto the Lord. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, the fountain of sufficient fullness through faith. The children of Israel were on their journey. And as they were moving from Egypt through the Red Sea unto the land of the Amalekites and the wilderness, and they were going to get to the promised land, uh, there was something that confronted them in the way. There was no water, and they needed a fountain of living waters that will satisfy all their thirst. Look at Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17 and we're reading from verse 3 here it says and the people thirsted there for water and the people murmured against Moses and said wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle were thirst, then in verse 4, were told, and Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto these people? They be almost ready to stone me. Look at verse 5. <clears throat> in verse 5, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. And take with thee and the, of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand and go. Verse 6 And behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock of Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. No water to drink, but it was a rock. And that rock that followed them was Christ. And the rock was meeting. Christ had been smitten. And because of that, the water of life comes out. And it becomes the fountain of living waters for everyone. We're told in Psalm 78, Psalm 78 verse 15, He claimed the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depths. And in verse 16, it says, He brought streams also out of the rock, and He caused waters to run down like rivers. We're looking at the fountain sufficient of sufficient fullness through faith. Three things we're looking at. Number one, fresh supply through sonship faith. Number two, full satisfaction through similar faith. Number three, fundamental sufficiency through surpassing faith. There is the sonship faith, there is the similar faith, and there is surpassing faith. Look at number one. Number one is the fresh supply through sonship faith. It tells us in Philippians chapter 4 verse 19, but my God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. My God shall supply all your need, the need of the soul, the need of the spirit, the need of the body, the need of the family, the need temporal, the need eternal. My God shall supply all your need. Then it says, according to its riches in glory by Christ Jesus. How is that 
done. What kind of faith will get that done? Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 20. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It says, I. You know, Paul was talking. A minister should be able to talk for himself and by himself, and he should be able to give his own testimony that we don't give to the people what we don't possess, and we don't ask of the people what ourselves we do not have. Paul the apostle, he was telling the people that their old man should be crucified with Christ, and then he himself he testified, am I preaching salvation? I must have that salvation. Am I preaching sanctification? I must have that sanctification. Am I preaching the power in the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You must have that as well. Are we talking about Christ, the one that supplies every need and the one that does everything in our lives, what the preacher says the people should have, he himself the preacher, he himself the minister, he himself the proclaimer must have. You tell other people to be saved, are you saved? You tell other people to be righteous, are you righteous? You teach restitution. Whatever we have taken from others, we restore unto them like Zacchaeus did. Do you make restitution or do you carry about guilty heart? condemned heart and every time you see that person you feel guilty are you a minister are you a preacher are you a teacher of the word of god what we declare to other people we ourselves must have paul said i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the Son of God. So she faith. So she faith. I live by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He'll accomplish that in every life in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two there. Number two there is our full satisfaction through similar faith. Similar. And when you use the word similar, you say that person has this kind of faith. I have faith like that. Similar faith. Moses had this kind of faith. I have faith like that. Similar faith. Paul the apostle had this kind of faith. I have a faith like that. Similar faith. Number two, our full satisfaction through similar faith. Faith. What kind of faith did they have? How did they have the fullness of satisfaction? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, reading from verse 13, spirit of faith, similar faith, according as it is written, I believe and therefore I speak. I have, I have spoken. Then it says, we also believe. And therefore speak similar faith. The same kind of faith they had at that time. If God has not changed, and if the problems are still there, the problems have not changed, the people who are going to receive a solution to their problem, they must have the same kind of faith that those people of old had. They believed, therefore they spoke. We believe and therefore we speak. Look at um, Romans chapter 4. And we're looking uh, at verse 12. Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 12. And the father of the circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith. Similar. They also walk in the steps of that faith of her father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, 
as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickness the dead and call it those things be, which be not as though they were. And then in verse 18, it says, who against hope believed in hope. Similar faith, similar faith. Against hope believed in hope. When the condition, when the situation, and when all the surrounding and circumstances, when they appear, hopeless yet he knows there is hope in god he knows there is hope in christ he knows there is hope because of the promises of god that's how they add their full satisfaction and we have similar faith that even though all the things around may look hopeless we have hope in god who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be somebody shout amen, amen. look at number three here number three is the fundamental sufficiency of surpassing our faith fundamental fundamental there are some things that are fundamental in life air the air we breathe it's a fundamental need we can't do without that the water we drink is a fundamental need we can't do without that the sleep we have in the night is a fundamental need even greater than the need of food fundamental and all the things that are fundamental in our journey all the things that are fundamental that we need and if we didn't have them will not last long in the kingdom god is going to give you the sufficiency of all your fundamental needs amen the fundamental sufficiency of surpassing faith surpassing faith what does that mean i want to enter a taxi i didn't know the driver before and i say this is where i'm going he said enter in and i have faith and i entered in and I didn't say, when did you renew your license last? No, I just have faith. And then while it's driving, I'm not looking here and there. I'm even reading newspapers. Why? I have faith that this man knows where he's going and he's taking me there now. If we have that faith in a driver, we do not know, we have not met, we must have surpassing faith for the deliverer who has saved us already. For the deliverer, he is not a stranger to us, we're not a stranger to him, and is the foundation of our faith. We have surpassing faith. You want to sit down or on a chair and you don't look at the arrangement of the molecules inside that chair you don't bang it and pull it apart whether it is solid enough you just sit down why and then you rest and you relax on that chair why because you have faith that that chair will carry your weight look at jesus christ he is the one on the throne and you say rest in me and relax in me come unto me all that labor and i have laden i will give you rest and why am i going to fear we have surpassing faith more than the faith we have to sit down on that chair we have a faith that surpasses anything and everything here on earth the fundamental sufficiency of surpassing faith we're looking at matthew chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 8 matthew chapter 8 we're looking at verse 8 the centurion answered and said lord i am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. That was surpassing faith. More than the faith the Israelites had in their Messiah. The Israelites had read about the coming of the Messiah from Genesis. 
to Exodus, to all the sacrifices in Leviticus, and to the promise and prophecy coming out of Deuteronomy, prophet like unto you, and was sent unto the people, and I'll put my word of power in his mouth. All those Israelites have read that, and yet when Christ came, they were blinded. The centurion that was not an Israelite, he said, speak the word only and my servant shall be healed that is surpassing faith the lord is asking for and then he gave a reason for that in verse 9 in verse 9 he says for i am a man under authority having soldiers under me and i say to this man go and he goes and to another come and he cometh and to my servant do this and he doeth it. And then in verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled, he marveled, and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Amen. If God, when God gives you that kind of faith, surpassing faith, everything you are asking for will be done in Jesus' name. All my needs are met. All my prayers are answered. All your prayers are answered in Jesus' name. I want you to look at chapter 15, chapter 15 of Matthew, and we're looking at verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Verse 23, in verse 23, but he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. And the woman could hear, because those disciples, they acted like a protective bodyguard. And they came to tell Jesus, Don't attend to her. She's crying too much aloud. She's a problem to our serenity, our peace. And Jesus kept quiet. But the woman will not give up. I will not give up. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, but he answered and said, I am not saint, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ah, is that so? Look at verse 25. In verse 25, then came she and worshipped him. She acted as if she didn't hear all those things that appeared negative. Send her away. Negative. She's crying. She's a noisy woman. Send her away. Negative. I'm not sent, but to the sheep of the house of Israel. Negative, apparently. But now, after all that, all that negative thing will not get into her heart. And she came and worship team. She didn't get angry. Some people are asking for prayer and if you don't get to their turn in time, they are angry. And some people are frustrated. If you don't answer them in the time they want, they are frustrated and they are panicking and they are crying and they are shouting. But you know the woman, she just said, Lord, still call him Lord. Okay, I used to call him Lord. I used to respect him. I used to put him high there but now because he didn't entertain to me the way I wanted and the time I wanted there's no uh, you know respect anymore but the woman came and said Lord help me look at verse 26 in verse 26 but he answered and said it is not suitable not right not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs you know the meaning of that a gentle dog dirty 
and defiled. And you want me to take the children's bread, the deliverance and uh, the healing belonging to the children and give it unto you? That's not right. The woman could have said, even Jesus, look at the way it's called. But she had already called him Lord. And the Lord has the right to tell you to your face who you are, how you are, and what your life looks like. And the woman understood. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and she said, truth, Lord, I cannot accuse you of ever telling a lie. You know me from my heart, from my background, and from my lifestyle. You know my tradition, you know my superstition, and you know my character. Truth, Lord, I am a gentle dog, but I come for mercy. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith. A test came to her and she passed the test. You all passed the test. And Jesus said, You have surpassing faith. What if it comes to your turn and you want to see the man of God? And you say, This is my problem. And the overseer told you, Uh uh. -uh you of all people, all the prayers that they have prayed, blind eyes have opened, the lame, they have risen up, they have walked, and even those who have much back, God has didn't you hear the testimony go, the my pastor has no time, if he's going to pray for one, one one, one by one, how many people go away, and then you become offended, you are so lean and you are so lean with anger and then everything is swollen even your eyeballs are swollen and then they say okay okay come now, uh -uh, I'm not coming again, take your pastor away it's your pastor, it's your overseer it's your convener <laughs> take him away, I don't want him anymore you'll not be like that in Jesus name, you see Jesus said, oh woman great is thy faith be each unto thee even as thou wilt and her daughter was made whole from that very hour that is surpassing our faith it will happen in your life in jesus name we're coming to point number three now point number three is a fortress of steadfast fortitude by faith fortitude Fortitude. You know the fortress, like a cave, like a mountain, and then you enter into that fortress, all the rain falling will not affect you. All the wild animals around that cave will not affect you. It's a fortress and you have entered in because you have steadfast fortitude. What's fortitude? Courage. The mind that will not move. The mind that will not shake. The desire that will not move anywhere that will say, I am here. Look at Goliath coming, calm and waiting. Fortitude. Look at the lions then. If you pray all these 30 days, except to the king. Then you'll be cast into the lion's den. Fortitude. Here I am. I will pray. If you don't bow to the idol of the village and the idol of the gang and the idol of your cultic, there's a fire. You have not seen it. You will see. You have fortitude. You are there and nothing will shake you from the face that you have in the Lord in Jesus name Amen. let the winds blow let the clouds drop the rain let the thunders roar let anything happen a person that has fortitude 
you remain and abide there and nothing from the pit of hell will shake you in Jesus name there, there is kind of faith a kind of faith that gives you that kind of courage that kind of stamina that kind of strength that kind of fortitude and then the Lord becomes a fortress for you and protection will be for you and everything you need in life because when others have run away and when others have said this is too much for them you're still there I am still there I am still there whatever water passes under the bridge I am still there whatever Jericho wall may surround you and it looks an impossible situation I am still there anybody still there I said anybody still there you remain faithful to the end in Jesus name Look at Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction. Why? Moses, why will you choose to suffer affliction? He said, you know, affliction is like fire. And there are some cords binding him. There are some things holding him. There are some bandage blindfolding him. He said, I'm going to go into that so that the fire of affliction will take off the bandage, will take off all the things that make you like if effeminate and sissy and not having backbone, having straw for backbone. I enter into that and then all the fire of affliction will burn away all that thing today the fire coming from on high will burn away everything holding you down in Jesus name so that like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego you are thrown into that fire of affliction and all the property of Nebuchadnezzar will burn out of your life in Jesus name and then Nebuchadnezzar himself will come and say did we not throw three men into the fire into the furnace behold I see four men and they stand up and they are walking that's number one number two number three Three, and the appearance of the fourth one is like the very son of God. All their chains were broken. All their fetters were burnt off because they were not bowed to Nebuchadnezzar. He said you will burn. No, people like us don't burn. It's your property that you tie us with that will burn. And all the things they tie you with today as you come to the Lord and say yes, I make my choice. I'm going to be with the people of God. All those things will burn off in your life. Choosing rather, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You see the dainty food of Nebuchadnezzar and the dainty food of Egypt will make you fat and flabby, will make you fat and, 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 fear, and the feeble. As, as they ate all those things of Egypt, it made them powerless, it made them without strength, without backbone. And Moses said, all those things that decrease spiritual power, I don't have anything to do with them anymore. All the pleasures of Egypt I resign and I throw away and I rather develop my backbone, the backbone of my faith following after the Lord. That's what it does for you when you stop hearing what they say in the world, eating what they eat in the world, drinking what they drink in the world and I'm in the pleasure they have in the world. All their dainty things that are weakening you, make you flabby and feeble. All those things are taken away and now you 
you are strong in Jesus name and then we're told in verse 26 it says in verse 26 esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward verse 27 in verse 27 by faith he forsook Egypt by faith he forsook Egypt by faith he forsook Egypt there are things to forsake there are things to say that's of Egypt I forsake it shines like gold it glitters like silver it appears good and the people who are taking them they are smiling they are say, saying if you don't have this you have never enjoyed anything in your life but I know the source of that thing is coming from the prince of this world and because of that he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king the wrath of the king was man, was was uh, minimized in his life and to his view for in Dios have seen him who is invisible and now uh, that is the very solution of life that you see him who is invisible he appears invisible and yet you look at him and you say I can see him there I see my healer there I see my deliverer there I see my redeemer there the people around you can see nothing they don't see where is the healer look at him standing there he said he will never leave me he'll never forsake me he's there the uplifter of my head and the uplifter of my life look at him standing there but the fellow who has some belief is blind he cannot see but Moses could see he saw him as seeing the invisible and when you see the invisible God by you all the time the Lord will rule all your problems away and the people who have that sight to see the invisible one they don't cry those who cry they see the mountain they don't see their Messiah they don't see the mountain mover the people who cry and the people who say oh God where are you oh, those people who say oh God where are you they don't see the invisible the people who see him and they know he is there my Lord Lamb cannot be quenched because I'm going to take this light and it's going to keep on shining until the final day. And they don't say where you are. Where are you? They know you say, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do. When you walk through life and you know that your Savior will never leave you. Your son fire will never leave you and the baptizer in the Holy Ghost will never leave you and the power from the highest will never leave you and you see him as seeing the visible you will conquer every mountain you will climb every mountain you will destroy every walk of the devil and as you are coming in the way you know satan has eyes to see you and he will see that you have been with christ he will command all his demons that man is coming clear out of the way that woman look at that woman with the eyes of faith and with the steps of faith and with the stamina of it the woman is coming she has surpassing faith clear out of the way i came to announce to you that from today this afternoon all those enemies will clear out of your way all those demons were clear out of your way and i want to announce to all the powers in the air all the powers in the sea all the powers in the forest the giants and the champions are coming clear out of the way where are the giants the champions stand like a champion stand like a militant soldier of Christ we're going everywhere in the world the giants the champions he has put something in our hearts we go with the Almighty 
We go with the one that will never fail. We go with the one that's always, always, always with us. We see the invisible. We have the invisible. We dwell in the invisible. That's where coming. Every enemy will clear out of your way. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, I am a champion now. Say, O oh Lord, I am a giant now. And nothing will drive me back from the path of righteousness anymore. The giants are coming. Let all those demons, all those powers, let them clear out of our way. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Pray and talk.